I wanted to focus here on retail and consumer goods to see what this could mean to, to your industry. Uh, th this could create some completely new customer journeys. Um, this could create a world of automated commerce, a world where the customer is no longer part of the decision flow, a world where algorithms are part of that decision flow and where I, as a consumer, I, out I may outsource certain decision processes to a machine, to an algorithm. And I'm convinced once that machine delivers, people will actually trust it. Just one example, imagine the, the one to 200 products that every family has to buy every month, you know, to stay alive and to keep yourself clean and your house clean. Most of those products are not like products that you get excited by if you go out and buy them. It's like, it's like laundry detergent. I mean, no one wakes up at Saturday morning and is like, oh yeah, today I can go out and buy laundry detergent. No one does that. If we can outsource that to a machine, we'll, we'll be willing to do that, that it just comes in like a service and we don't have to worry about it anymore. This is a company from San Francisco that is playing with that. It's a company called Boxed. And they look at your behavior, at your patterns of consumption in your house, and then they basically try to guess what kind of products you need, and over time this becomes more and more accurate, and every week they bring you this, this box, and it contains the products that need to be refilled, and you don't have to worry about it. Because you may think you're unique, but your life is just a set of patterns that happens all over and over again at a certain rhythm, so it's pretty easy to predict this. And if we can do this, we will trust it. Huh? Once the algorithm delivers, we will trust it. This, will be, this is just this one, one of the examples that may influence the customer journeys in the future in the retail and consumer branding world. Our next guest speaker is author Stephen Van Belligem. He's the author of four best-selling books, including Customers the Day After Tomorrow, which has been sold more than 100,000 100, copies in seven different languages. He's also an entrepreneur, co-founding a consultancy firm and a content creation company. When he's not traveling the world or writing, Stephen also serves as a part-time marketing professor at Valeric Business School in Ghent, Belgium. Please give a warm connections welcome to Stephen van Belligem. And, and you know, to become really customer-centric, I think one of the most important things is to escape your bubble. You guys live in your insurance bubble, I live in my own crazy Steven bubble, and the challenge is how can you get out of it? And, and how can you invest time in it uh, for that? About a year ago, I had the enormous pleasure to meet with President Obama when he was in Europe, and, and this is one of the topics that he talked about. He, he said if you live in the White House as President of the United States, that is probably the biggest bubble you can potentially live in, because your life as President of the US is totally different than the life of any citizen of the country, which are my customers, is what he said. And he had a number of tactics to get out of that bubble. And, and one of them was, was so simple, but I think it was truly effective. It, it really inspired me. Um, every night when he was sitting president, he asked his team to give him 10 letters that were written to him by American citizens. Uh, they, he told us when he was in office, he received about 15,000 letters a month. And he asked his team for, for a random selection of 10 every night, and that was the last thing he did before he went to bed. And he told us, you know, as president, you get your binder every night with your homework to get ready for the meetings for the next day. And then you, you have to start with things like uh, the war in Afghanistan or solving an economical crisis. And then you read a letter from a couple in Arizona that doesn't have enough money to pay for their health care and you realize, I worked really hard today, but I had zero impact on the lives of those people, my customers. And I think that's, that's one of our challenges. How can we get closer to what customers really want, and how can we then use technology to, to enable that customer happiness? And in that field, th this here is one of my favorite quotes. It's from Larry Page, one of the founders of Google. He's like, come on, guys, how is, it, how is it possible? I mean, we've got Elon Musk here with SpaceX, and he's like launching ro rockets every two weeks, and then he's releasing 20 satellites at a time, and then that rocket vertically comes back to the planet, and it lands on a floating device in the middle of the ocean. We can do that. But making a toaster that does not burn toast, that seems to be like the hardest thing ever. Huh? And, and you know what? We, we, we have smart toasters now. They invented smart toasters. 
And a smart toaster, my friends, it sends you a text message the moment your toast is ready. Huh? <laughs> that is in case you have forgotten what happened with that piece of bread in those 30 seconds. <laughs> and then you get a text message. Oh, yeah, for, of course, I forgot. It was in the toaster. And you still get burned toast. <laughs> I mean, this is what they call the internet of stupid things. Huh? You, you make it because technology enables you to do it, but there's not a single human on the planet who actually needs a smart toaster. How can we create value for our customers? And if you look in your landscape, I think there's a very interesting case study happening, the launch of Disney+. Plus. They soft launched it last week in the Netherlands, actually, is what I've uh, learned. You can use it there for free now. Um, but the big launch is, is planned for the US in, in a few weeks. Um, it's interesting to see how Disney canceled their subscription with Netflix, how they acquired Fox Media, and how they became the biggest content owner and owned the biggest media brands you can, you can imagine. Um, and now they're launching it in a very aggressive way. Uh, prices are going to be below the Netflix prices. We saw Apple TV Plus last week. That was launched even cheaper and sometimes for free if you buy Apple hardware. So it's interesting to see how the Netflix monopoly in six months' time, it became an extremely competitive landscape and the things are changing. But Disney, I think, in a very smart way, looked at their assets, and their assets are brands, obviously, Star Wars, Disney, Pixar, Marvel. If you look at the movie theater revenues, I think most of them come from those houses, those studios. Now they leverage that, and that's interesting. Uh, it's about faster and real time. Can you anticipate? Can you predict certain things and solve problems before customers know that there's a problem? Hyper-personalization. I don't care about the average customer of your company. I only care about myself, the individual customer. And it's about making it more convenient than ever before. Uh, and I want to show you two examples of two totally different companies that play this game in a very smart way. The first one is a company that's not really known uh, for most people in the West. It's a company called Totiao. It's part of the ByteDance group. And Totiao is the most popular media app in China. It is like any news app that you have in your country. Um, it has articles from journalists, it also has articles from social influencers, it also has articles written by computers. That's not the big differentiator. The big differentiator is their AI behind it. So if I open my favorite Belgian news app, what happens, every Belgian sees the same news. And we swipe through that news and then our brain is the filter to select what we look at or decide not to look at, right? That's how it works for most of us. At Totiao, it's different. They only send you the news of which they know that you would like to see it. So from a society point of view, you can criticize this pretty intensively, huh? because they're putting a filter on you that you only get a very narrow view on the world. They reinforce your thinking in an extreme way. So a lot of negative aspects to that. If you look at it from a business perspective, it is only positive. Totiao is now the most addictive platform in the world. An average Chinese person spends 74 minutes a day on Totiao, which is 50% more than what the rest of the world spends on Facebook per day. And the speed of monetization is something we haven't seen before. This is a graph that shows you the first four years of the existence of some of the most valuable companies in the world. And then you see that this group here, these are like the, the losers in making money. Huh? Facebook, Tencent, LinkedIn, losers. Google did an okay job, and Totiao is going twice as fast as Google. This is unseen. But then you understand the power of these benefits. My feeling is that the easy years of digital are behind us. I think the challenges that are ahead of us are more complex than what we've faced in the last 10 years. Just look, for instance, into the world of mobility. In the past 20 years, we digitized maps, which is really, really important and really cool. That brings us to places. And it has a 99.9% .9 accuracy. But in the next 20 years, we want to put driverless cars on those roads. Uh, look at healthcare. In the past, in the last 20 years, we discovered Dr. Google. And we know how that one works, right? Then you have a headache. Then you tell Google, hey, Google, I have a headache. And then Google tells you, you will die. 
Huh? Slowly and painfully. That's how Dr. Google works. In the next 20 years, we're talking about CRISPR technology and editing DNA. Look at the early days of Amazon, the early days of e-commerce. Jeff Bezos said, I don't want to do the shipping, I don't want to do the warehousing, I just want to have the platform. Today, Amazon is building the largest logistics fleet the world has ever seen. So in the early days, it was like, cheap and easy, today it becomes complex and expensive. Uh, if, if you look at the strategy of Starbucks, one of their growth areas is uh, delivery after a mobile order. I don't know if you ever thought this through what, what this implies for a company like Starbucks. Huh? This, this means that you talk to your phone and you say, hey Starbucks, I want to have my favorite coffee. I mean, in that scenario, the idea of next day delivery not really sure about it. Huh? Half-day delivery with hot beverages is still ridiculous. One-hour delivery is not good enough. You're talking about lightning delivery. Five to maximum ten minutes later, they have to bring your favorite drink wherever you may be at that moment. And we see that happening in China. T Starbucks, in fact, is experimenting with this in China. They use their big network of stores that they're building there to build a logistics network to do a delivery in five minutes' time. Their plan is to open up a new Starbucks every 15 hours for the next four years, creating a network to enable lightning delivery, not doing it all by themselves, but also working with world-class partners like Alibaba and Meituan that will do those deliveries. But you feel that these kind of deliveries are far more complex than just sending a book that can be there the next day. And you feel how competition is becoming more complex. In the past, you had company A against company B against company C. Today, it's more network A against network B, platform A against platform B. You see that in the automotive industry, for instance. If, if you look at the traditional mindset, you have Audi, BMW, Mercedes fighting with each other. What you see is that BMW, Audi, and Mercedes, together they acquired Nokia maps to have mapping capabilities and not being depending on Google or Amazon. And then you see that a company like BMW starts to work together with Daimler in to go into the ride-sharing business. I mean, this is not some local grocery here in Stockholm around the corner. Huh? This is BMW and Mercedes, two of the most valuable brands in the world, companies that have been around for more than 100 years, that are extremely rich, that have the best engineers in the world, and they believe that they cannot do it alone. Uh, you have to work together, and friends can become enemies, and it's about building a network to really enable those customer benefits. Uh, you feel the evolution of work happening right in front of us. In the past, we all worked with our hands. Today, most of us work with our brains. In the future, if you want to differentiate yourself as a human, it will be about how can we work with our heart, because that is something a machine is not capable to do. I think too many organizations ask this question, and I think it's a wrong question. What can we do to make our customer loyal to us? If you have this brainstorm, you come up with loyalty programs, points, saving stuff, and in the worst case, a 2019 calendar that you make for them. How about turning this question around and saying, what can we do to show our loyalty to our customers? And this is about being there for them when they really need you, being there for them when they find it important. And if you do that, they will reward you with their loyalty. But it starts from our organizations. We cannot expect it to start from them. You cannot ask loyalty if you don't give loyalty. And if you give loyalty to them for four years, they will stay loyal to you. It's about giving first and then asking it back. We have the habit of asking first and then we're going to give. I think we need to turn this around. Because every company has strengths that the technology players do not have. It's just a matter of identifying them and then leveraging them. I, li I like the case of Walmart because they are in the eye of the storm. Um, and if you look at the value evolution of the big retailers in the US, it's pretty clear that most of them lost most of their value. Amazon, of course, exploded. But Walmart is like the only one that is, that is managing its value and is even increasing its value with 23% in the last 10 years. 
Uh, and, but these guys are pretty smart. Huh? They were thinking, okay, what do we have that Amazon does not have? And stores, obviously, is, is one of the things. But now they're changing the philosophy in their stores. Their, their store is not just a physical location. They're turning it into a digital platform that happens to be offline. Uh, in the past, when you came in to pick up a package that you ordered online, you had to wait in line, and then someone had to get it. It could take up to 10 minutes. Now they, ha they have these pickup machines where you just scan your phone and basically 30 seconds later you have your product. This is being laser focused on saving out time of customers. Uh, same with returns. Now you can do it in 30 seconds. What else does Walmart have much more than Amazon? That's employees. Walmart has 1.4 million employees and now they're asking those people to drop off packages on their way home because they're all driving home every night and they're passing by houses of people that bought stuff online and they're trying to make it a triple win. They're trying to, you know, ask, ask those people to deliver packages, and if they do, they can make extra money on the way home. Customers have their product sooner than with Amazon, and um, it's good for the environment because that car is driving home anyway, and you don't need a separate van to drop these things off. So I think it's smart, and you see that they're holding on. I mean, if you look at the, 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 the buying intentions during the last holiday season, you know, there were as many people buying from Walmart as we had people buying from Amazon. And that's because they leverage their strengths. It's not just because you have humans that they are a strength. You have to figure out a way how to leverage that. It's not because you have physical locations that it is a strength. You have to figure out how to leverage that. Most crucial elements of that is being obsessed with user convenience. It's the bottom of the pyramid. If you don't do that, you're going to lose impact on everything else that you do. Look, we, we have a room here, obviously, with very smart people, so I'm convinced some of you invested some money in companies like Facebook and Apple and Amazon, and that explains the positive and relaxed atmosphere that we have here today. Um, but I, I truly hope that we have someone who invested in this company, a company that outperformed Google times 100 on the stock market in the last decade. And it's a company that I think you all know. It's a company called Domino's Pizza. Is there anyone in this room who invested money in Domino's Pizza in the last 10 years? I need to know. <laughs> you can identify yourself now. No one. I have to be honest, I've been asking this question now for the last three months all over Europe, and I haven't had a single person yet who raised his or her hand with this question. So my conclusion is, if you did invest in Domino's Pizza 10 years ago, you don't come to these kind of meetings anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you have new hobbies in life then. But isn't it strange? I mean, this is Domino's Pizza. This is not Apple or Amazon. They did not change the world. These guys have been making pizza for the, la for the last 50 years, and they're probably going to make pizza for the next 50 years. But still, they did such a good job. And, you know, I like to use a metaphor to illustrate their strategy. Just imagine yourself for a second. You and your best friend, you're walking in the jungle. Ah, you and your best friend in the jungle, and it's beautiful weather, the scenery is great, you're taking some selfies, it's a beautiful day. But suddenly a lion shows up. What is important at that moment if you want to survive that situation? You, you need to be faster than your friend. <laughs> there is absolutely no need to be faster than the lion. Just be faster than your friend and you will live. And that is exactly the strategy that Domino's Pizza used. They were asking themselves, can we be faster than Amazon? Not in 100 years. But can we be faster than Pizza Hut? Yes, we can. That is doable. So their strategy was like this. How can we become the fastest, the easiest, and the most fun place in the world to order pizza? And they started to shamelessly copy-paste Amazon on, on some parts. Uh, they, they created this, the push for pizza button. And this is actually based on a very simple consumer insight. Huh? They, they learned from their data analytics. Domino's Pizza transformed itself from a pizza company to a technology company. Data analytics has become a vital element of their strategy. And they learned a very simple insight. 80% of their consumers ordered the same pizza every single time. 80% the same pizza every single time. That means as a marketing individual, if you make an app 
and you put the entire menu on it, that you are frustrating 80% of your customers every single time they use it. They just want to have a button to order their favorite pizza. That's exactly what they did. Bomb and hoopla. 20 minutes later, you got your favorite pizza. Or this one here is also brilliant. The zero click app. Brilliant. You just have to open it and then your favorite pizza will show up 20 minutes later. You don't have to push any button anymore. You know, I can imagine during meetings that you're like, oh, guys, I accidentally pushed the zero click app here, so uh, pizza is on its way. But they, they became the easiest and the fastest and the most fun place to order pizza from, and it made them incredible successful. They are focused on user convenience, and they've done that in a very, very smart way.